President Coleman, Board of Regents, distinguished guests, faculty and staff, and especially you graduates who have earned the right <clears throat> to be here today. Thank you for those very kind words. And I want to offer my congratulations to Faith Ringgold and Ann Stevenson for their contributions and fine work. You know, it's an honor for me to be here today. It's a real highlight in my life, and I'm humbled by the experience. It's a pleasure to be one of the first to be able to congratulate you graduates for arriving at this moment. It's a culmination of many years of study, learning, and hard work. And it represents the cornerstone of your future. Donning this gown today takes me back some 50 years. It was in 1958 when I was preparing to leave Lehigh University and enter into the business world. The world was full of uncertainty. The economy wasn't great. Does that sound familiar? Unemployment was at 7 percent. And the average wage, I'm saying the average wage, was just under $4,000 per year. Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, and the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States was in full swing. Nita Khrushchev was a premier of the USSR, and international tensions were escalating. But there were high points also. Pan American Airlines flew the first nonstop flight from New York to London, and a company called Bethlehem Steel was at its greatest height after building over a thousand warships in World War II and supplying metal for every bridge and every tunnel going from New Jersey into Manhattan. The Soviet Union had put Luna 1 into space, the first spacecraft to leave the Earth's pull of gravity. And nearly every car sold in that year was built by GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Now let's fast forward some 50 years to today. I see a world changing at warp speed right before our eyes. Pan Am has been replaced by numerous other airlines, and our entire airline industry is struggling. Bethlehem Steel went bankrupt in 2004. The Soviet Union no longer exists, and right here in southeast Michigan, our domestic big three automakers are fighting for survival. The fact is, the world I see is much different than back in 1958. Today, of course, the big challenge we face is our struggling financial system and in an economy that is making us rethink how we spend every dollar. Consumer confidence is at one of the lowest points in history. So far this year, the companies that make up the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 have lost nearly 27, excuse me, $7 trillion in market value. That's a staggering statistic. We have seen several of our core financial institutions go by the wayside. You know, it's hard to explain how our government can hand over $700 billion in a single weekend to rescue financial institutions, yet it has taken weeks to debate the merits of supporting our automakers with $14 billion. <laughs> Who, by the way, contribute to the largest single sector of the retail sales in our economy. How did we get here? It didn't happen overnight. We lost focus, that's how. We took our high eye off the ball. We tossed aside hard work, ethics, and integrity for quick profits and extravagance. Our governance lost focus, too. 
by not understanding the consequences of unchecked consumer debt and ignored the warning signs that led to the housing mess we see today. Wall Street lost focus, too, by getting carried away with fast profits and not downplaying the details. Investors lost focus by only looking at returns and not at the bigger picture of assessing risk. And American citizens lost focus by spending more than they could afford, and not by holding their elected officials accountable. Fixing all this will require a change in the way we govern. It will require change in the way we live. It will require changes in the way we manage our businesses. And it will acquire full support of President-elect Obama as he takes the reins of the United States in January. In all of this, I'm sure you're questioning, how will this affect you personally? You're probably concerned about your timing and asking, you know, why me? Do I have to graduate during this economic meltdown? But I have a different view of that, really. I say, look at this as an opportunity. Use it as a launching pad for better things. Believe it or not, I think you'll be better off for all of this. Why? Because 50 years ago, we couldn't buy a home without a down payment. We needed to save 20 percent. We did it. You'll do it, too. We needed to establish credit by buying something small and building up to something bigger. We did it. You'll do it, too. We expected to start at entry-level positions and climb the stair steps to success. We did it. You'll do it, too. There's nothing wrong with that. It builds character. And character and your reputation are the most important assets you will ever own. <clears throat> Are you honest? Are you ethical? Are you dependable? Do you care about other people? You know your reputation can be tarnished in an instant if you're not careful. Think about it this way, and I'll use 2008 terms. Life is one giant, constantly running blog. People talking to other people. People talking about you. The question is, what are they saying about you? I urge you to do something today. Make a conscious decision to begin establishing the reputation you will carry with you for the rest of your life. Character and reputation are built strong by the many things you do right, but they're also defined on how you handle adversity, how you act when things are not going your way, through it all, good days and bad, you'll have control over one thing, and that one thing is your reputation. And I would say this, the headlines that you read today, the news on TV, the internet blogs, and all the talk in Washington, they all barely scratch the surface of the real story on what's going on in the world. They don't tell you what you're really walking into. And as a businessman, I've been in your shoes before. Back in the 70s, I wanted to build our truck leasing company into a larger player. But at the time, the headlines painted a very bleak picture. There was a lot of headwind with interest rates, believe it or not, at 19 percent. And then in the 80s, General Motors was selling its diesel engine business that was no longer competitive on the worldwide stage. It had lost hundreds of millions of dollars and had only 3 percent market share. We decided to approach these as opportunities. And you know what happened? Today we have the largest leasing business in the world. 
And that diesel engine business turned a profit in the second year and grew its market share to 30 percent. My point is this. In the middle of all this bad news, look at the foundations of our economy as a building block to opportunity. Believe me, the news is not all bad. Did you know that productivity in the United States business sector has increased 19 percent since the year 2000? Did you know Ford and General Motors have thriving businesses outside North America? Did you know that Americans are still the best in the world at starting new businesses and developing new technologies? Fifty years ago, who would have ever thought we would be marketing from the Internet, carrying iPods, and watching TV in our cars? And how about personal finances? Did you know that credit really is still available to you to buy a home or to buy a car? Or did you know that contrary to what you're hearing, 96 percent of Americans are paying their bills on time? And did you know that U.S. households hold $56 trillion worth of net worth? My point is this. Don't believe everything you hear. There is an opportunity out there, and it's up to you to find it. What we need to do now is get on the job of rebuilding. And I think that's where you students come in. You are about to participate in the level of change that will make the last 50 years look like they're standing still. It's an exciting time. It's a time of opportunity. And as graduates of this renowned university, you hold the keys to changing the next 50 years. I am convinced you will break our dependence on foreign oil and change world politics in the process that you will be on the teams that isolate the causes of cancer and stop them in their tracks. Those of you who have studied law will be faced with unchartered legal and ethical questions. Those in public policy will be challenged to deal with health care, taxes, our economy, and our environment, yet still find a way to reward the entrepreneurial values that are at the heart of our great country. As you walk out the doors today of Chrysler Arena this afternoon, understand that you're walking into a world where a billion new people are about to enter the middle class. A billion people with $10 trillion of purchasing power. The challenge is that those people happen to be in China and in India and other developing countries and you will need to connect with them. And at the same time, there are a billion other people in the world without enough food to eat, clean water to drink. You will need to connect with them too, people in Africa and other development, underdeveloped countries. There are a lot of raw potential in those places, and the world cannot afford to overlook them much longer. Now you're probably thinking, okay, this Roger Penske guy thinks that business can bring the whole world together. Well, I would say yes. I do believe that business holds the keys to bringing the world together. Believe it, because I've seen it happen inside our Penske family of businesses. When we put teams together from Asia, Europe, and North America, the language is common. It's business. And I can tell you this. I know the value that business brings to global relationships. We bring the ability to make a decision and create an opportunity. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, it's not. Throughout my career, I've seen people agonize over decisions. They study things this way, they study things that way, then they convince themselves that both ways are wrong. So they form a committee to study them some more. 
Can I tell you something? Don't be afraid to make a decision as you move on from this great university. Look at it this way. You can spend all your time trying to make the right decision and miss an opportunity in the process. Or you can move more quickly to make the decision and spend all your time making it right. The fact is, things are moving so fast that reaction is late. But we need to be, as individuals in this country, we need to anticipate. And there's another thing that we need in our flattening world, and that's informed optimism. I can tell you that many cultures approach problems as a series of barriers. They instantly focus on why something can't be done. They use pessimism to define limitations rather than optimism to define possibilities. In the process, creativity tends to slow down when optimism ends. You know, if we had focused on limitations some 50 years ago, do you think we'd have an international space station today? Or would we have the world at our fingertips with our PDAs and our cell phones? People said it couldn't be done. I guess they're wrong. Let me give you a piece of advice. Decide to be an optimist. Be the person out there that can look at 100 problems and see each of them as an opportunity. Be the person with the imagination to see how things can be right, rather than one who is always ready to point out what is wrong. Let me give you some examples closer to home. You can look at Detroit and see a city with lots of problems. Or you can ask yourself how many cities in the United States have that kind of waterfront and that kind of corporate community support. Or you can look at the state of Michigan and see a state caught in an economic downturn. And you can ask yourself how many states have a research and development base like ours or a school like the University of Michigan. So I would say this. Optimism does not need to be superficial. You still need to be in control of the facts and understand the risks. But you could also create an environment which allow you and also your colleagues an opportunity to fail. That's where the real growth begins. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when it's next to impossible to convince yourself to be optimistic. But the fact is, we choose our attitudes. Choose to be positive. It will serve you well. Before I close, I want to share a phrase with you that I've used my whole life. It's only three words. It's simple. Effort equals results. Simple, straightforward. Effort equals results. You need to work for what you want in life. You get out the direct proportion of what you put in. There are no free rides. There are no shortcuts. If you want to be successful, you need to put in the effort. You've already proved that that works. You're sitting here today because you put forth the effort. You stuck to your plan. You studied. You passed your exams. And you're about to see the results as you receive your degrees. That gives me a lot of confidence. Though I might not like the headlines today, when I look at all of you, I have the confidence that things will get better. I know there's a good reason to be optimistic about the next 50 years. In your faces, I see potential. Potential born of the values you have learned from your families and your loved ones. Potential born of the education that gives this great institution has given you. Potential for your ideas to change the world and the potential that you will realize is your effort equals results. It's been my privilege to talk to you today. Congratulations. The world awaits you. Thank you very much.